Hello, this week on The Gadget Show, Jason and I have flown to Germany, Hanover to be precise, to visit CBIT. It's the world's biggest IT and telecoms exhibition. Also this week, I hook up with superstar DJ Pete Tong to see how to become a master mixer in your own bedroom with the help of some pretty impressive gadgetry. Tom Dunmore checks out the best music download sites and we show you just how easy it is to link up with family and friends on a computer video link. But first, John and Jason at CBIT. There's no point explaining what CBIT stands for. It's German and a throwback to the days when the show was all about office furniture. These days it's Europe's biggest technology show and it's huge. Thousands of the world's biggest high-tech companies spread across almost 30 halls, all with their very latest gadgetry to show off. And there's a fair few people to show off too. This year, more than half a million assorted techies and geeks turned up to check out what the show has to offer. So, how are we going to see all the stuff on show here at CBIT? Well, John's got a camera. And Jason's got a camera. And we're going to split up and scour the show for anything that might be of interest to you. The halls are dominated by the big boys of the tech world, like Microsoft, showing off their new Vista operating system. And that can make it tricky to find those little gems we love turning up on the gadget show. But fear not, because we found them. Do you want? Clothes. Everything that you've now got on your little laptop or your mobile phone is going to make its way into the very fabrics that we wear. As you can see, these girls are wired for multimedia. They've got a small <coughs> computer device in the small of their back, just around here. Here's the interface. This is how you'd uh, put your volume up, change tracks, access the internet, whatever it be. Um, Kai's also got headphones in. These headphones are not your normal headphone out, but they're actually wired into the very fabric that she's wearing. The clothes are designed to let you slip all your gadgets into discreet pockets hidden around the garment, leaving you fully wired for sound. The next stage is for our clothes to become connected, and this prototype snowboard jacket does that. It's got what you'd expect, loads of pockets, one for your mobile phone there. But unusually, this mobile phone, as long as it possesses Bluetooth, can be operated by this multifunction display built into the clothes fabric. That, in turn, can communicate with this device on the top. It's a GPS. This jacket is capable of telling you exactly what position you're at using GPS technology, but more importantly, via cellular transmission, telling the internet exactly where you are. It has all kinds of safety implications for snowboarders who get lost. More importantly, if you've done a particularly good route down a mountain, you can view it back. When you get back to your little Apre ski bar, check out your route, maybe change it for the next day snowboarding. And with location-based services likely to be big business in the near future, a jacket that knows where it is will be very useful, recommending good restaurants near your location or special offers in shops you're passing. The other area computers are moving into is cars. Microsoft have a plan to put windows into cars. Hmm. It's a fairly modest plan to start with, involving cooperation with Fiat and Alfa Romeo. You get a USB socket in the glove box, into which you can connect any USB stick or MP3 player. And any music tracks play automatically through the car's stereo, and you can control them using buttons on the steering wheel. It also links with any Bluetooth devices and imports your contacts into storage in the car. Other areas where we'll see more computer involvement are ever more sophisticated traffic information systems and automatic upgrading of the car's software and diagnosis of faults over the internet, leading ultimately, no doubt, to the car that will drive itself. You've heard of virtual reality, VR, augmented reality, AR. Well, this is TR, tangible reality. It mixes real-world objects with virtual objects. When you move objects around the table, their virtual twins move in real time on the screen. So turn the real duck and the virtual duck also turns. And there's more. When you move the lighting icon, this changes the direction the scene is lit from. Move the camera icon and you can change your view of the entire scene. It's simple and very beautiful. It works using optical recognition. A real camera looking at the underside of the table reads coded stickers on the bottoms of the real-life objects. Each sticker has a unique combination of colours and dots on it, and each of those combinations is tied in to a different shape. So this one, pink and blue there, 
and those two dots corresponds to this red square. So if I actually replace that with exactly the same shape, but no physical object, the object itself, as you can see, falls on the table. And there are loads of real-world applications for this technology. Architects can use it to move freely around their creations long before they're ever built. Designers can present their work in a much more interactive way. And imagine computer games using this technology, or kids' toys, where they can create their own cartoons starring their favourite characters. One of the most popular creations at the show was this thing. Every single reporter we met had had a play with it. Can you see what he's doing with it? So, she's the eye thing. And John didn't want to be left out. It's a similar technology to the one used in American Apache helicopters, which ensures the nose-mounted machine gun is always pointing exactly where the pilot's looking. The headset has a pair of cameras watching your eye movements and then feeding that information to another small camera mounted above your forehead. This pans and tilts in full synchronization with your eyeballs and records a picture of exactly what you're looking at. It's designed for use in surgery, so that what the surgeon sees can be recorded and seen by others. All very worthwhile, but think of the possibilities for computer gaming. And while I'm on the subject of eyes, look at this. It's an optical pointing device and basically replaces a conventional mouse with a system that follows where you're looking. So the cursor, in this case a red dot, is controlled purely by eye movement. Now, there's an infrared light projected at you from around the screen and it reflects off your eyes and the reflections are picked up by a camera down here. Now, depending on which bit of the screen you're looking at, the reflections are different and it can tell where you're looking down to an accuracy of one pixel. Initially, it's intended to be used by people with severe disabilities, but it's so effective and simple, I can't see why in time it couldn't replace the conventional mouse entirely. It's great, but I suppose it could give rise to a new ailment, RSIs. Controlling a computer with a physical interface is one thing, even if it is just a flick of your eyes. But the next interface I stumbled upon at CBIT was truly mind-blowing. In the three years I've worked for The Gadget Show, I've seen some pretty incredible stuff, but nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to what I'm about to show you. This has to be the ultimate interface, controlling a computer using nothing but your brain. Now all the electrodes on his head, what they do is they pick up the EEG or the electrical activity of the brain and they translate that into letters. Apparently the guy wearing the electronic swimming hat uses a sort of yes-no protocol by thinking about moving his right arm when he wants to get a positive response and his left arm for a negative response. In this way, he can apparently write whole sentences purely by the power of thought. Now, to demonstrate that this thing really works, I'm going to write something on this piece of paper and give it to the guy wearing the brain gear. He's got no idea what I'm about to write. He's going to read it, and then, using nothing but brain power, what I've written on the page should appear on one of these computer screens. Okay, here goes. Hi, how you doing? Don't, uh, it's better if you don't speak Interrupt, to them understood. Okay, so I'm not going to be rude. I've just got to ignore him because that might affect the study. Predictably, I asked him to write the title of our show and then stood well back so as not to distract him. Now, I've just been told that this is the first time they've tried this technology using English because, of course, this is a German show, it's a German technology, and the device is set up to recognize German words. Amazingly, as I stood there, I watched the words appear. It took a good two or three minutes, but that didn't matter. I was watching technology allow a man to communicate purely with the power of his brain. I mean, just think of what this technology means. I mean, if you can think language, but for some reason you can't speak, this machinery could enable you to communicate with other people. And of course, this is happening right now, live. In, I don't know, five or 10 years, we could all be communicating with each other by just thinking about it. And on that thought, We'll leave CBIT for the moment, but stick around because there's much more to tell you about the show, including the first proper hands-on TV test of the star of the show. It's what everyone in the computer world's talking about, and I'm rather chuffed to see we got it first, the Ultra Mobile PC. Now it's time for another of our regular guides aimed at helping you get the most from your gadgets. This week, how to set up a webcam video link. 
Instant messaging is a favourite way to keep in touch without running up a huge bill. But the latest technologies now mean that we don't even have to put a finger to the keyboard. Video Link has well and truly arrived. Here's how to get started. The first bit of kit you need is the all-important webcam. There are plenty to choose from to suit your needs, from the basic, like this PC line, to the designer, like the Logitech QuickCam Fusion. You can buy specialist models for your laptop, such as the QuickCam for notebooks. Our favourite webcam is the Creative Live Motion, a camera that spookily follows your movement around the room. You'll also need the right audio equipment to be able to chat with your friend, a microphone and speakers. Some webcams, like the Fusion, have an integrated microphone. Otherwise, a headset is a great way to chat hands-free. Headsets also vary in price and quality. And to save money, look out for them bundled with your webcam. As with this, communicate for Messenger set. Now you need to install the software that comes with your webcam. Insert your CD-ROM and your webcam provider will take you through each step. Here you can set your microphone levels to the right volume and make sure that everything's connected properly. More advanced hardware will need a bit more work. With the Creative Live Motion, you'll need to configure the camera's movement using its handy arrow buttons. Once your webcam is installed, you'll need a chat program to run it on. The old favourites MSN Messenger and Yahoo both support video chat, as does the latest version of Skype. All of these programmes can be downloaded for free from their respective websites. When your chat programme is installed and you and your friend are online, choose Start Video Conversation and your programme will automatically detect your new webcam. Many chat programmes don't just show your friend's camera but also your own. So, now that you're immersed in the world of video chat, you can make sure that you look good while you're at it. Welcome back to Subit. The reason I'm excited about Samsung is that they usually deliver, they've normally got some techno tricks up their sleeves. And a quick look around their stands showed that this year was no exception. Pretty sexy digital camera, wouldn't you say? Just look at that lens action, except it's not just a digital camera. It's also a mobile phone. The world's first 10 megapixel mobile phone. It's not enough for phones to just be phones anymore. And when it comes to cramming functionality into handsets, how about this? This is fantastic. A dedicated 3D gaming accelerator within the phone. And more impressively, these audio-visual glasses, this headset. This is really good. It's, it's an immersive experience. It's kind of first-generation PlayStation quality graphics, and it's very playable. The buttons are really nicely configured. The whole thing also has Wi-Fi functionality, so this experience could be multiplayer. Because it's got a dedicated gaming chip on board, not only can I plug things like this into it, I can also put it into my TV when I get home. Go on. I tell you what, the days of your MP3 player could well be numbered. This phone, as well as having a 2 megapixel camera on the back and all your usual mobile phone functionality, has got an 8 gig hard drive built in. 8 gigabytes! That's getting on for 2,000 MP3s. And better still, you can plug in one of these babies, press the play button, and have the sound coming out of your telly. That feed that you're seeing there, that music that you're hearing, is coming from this mobile phone. It seems you can stuff an awful lot into a mobile these days, although the real multifunction star of the show, the headliner in every report filed from CBIT, was this. What the webheads among you will know as Project Origami. It's Samsung's ultra mobile PC, a tiny little slab based affair, the size of a, I don't know, a normal sized paperback book. It's a new take on the tablet PC idea. Smaller, more compact, and with a lot more functionality. As well as being a fairly powerful PC, it's a personal video player, a TV, an MP3 player, a computer games console. It's equipped with a touchscreen, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. It can even act as a GPS sat-nav. 
It will cost around seven to 800 quid when it's launched in June. Also on show at CBIT were versions from Asus and Founder. The idea is that the UMPC is a new class of computer that anyone can make. But for a device that's all about mobility, you don't want to be stuck on a stand with it. You want to have the thing in your hands and get out and about on the streets. And that's just what we've done. We had a word and they gave us one. In fact, me and John have already taken this out for a test drive. I say test drive. We actually took a very pleasant train ride ensconced in our own compartment. Oh, look, oh, look that? at that. That, that, that? Was, that was really terrible. We played with it for hours and hours. And then got rid of it again. We ran it through pretty much every function it claims to perform. I am using the microphone wizard. It is adjusting the volume of my microphone. We poked it. How do you get that back? There you go. There's the, this is that thing, look. Prodded it. USB. And left no flap unturned. Another oh, USB. USB. Oh, this is an out. This is interesting. This could be a video out. So, what do we think? Is the Ultra Mobile PC the next big thing? Who's it for, do you think? It's an interesting thing. That's a really good question. Yeah. Who, you know, who's this device marketed at? If you find laptops slightly too large, you don't use a keyboard that much, you don't use DVDs that much, this is a great, more portable, slightly chunkier option. I'd quite like a ruggedized version. I think that'd be as one you could chuck about. Yeah. And that, that would give it an added dimension. Matte rubber. Could go for rubber, yes. It's just another evolution of the portable PC. It's not a revolution. No, I agree. It's a sideways movement. It's something interesting to ogle at and play with. Uh, but it's not going to change your life. But what does? So, our conclusion on the Samsung Q1, good, but not brilliant. Perhaps the cleverest thing, though, about this device is the way it was introduced to the world. Join John later when he looks into the modern internet phenomenon that is viral marketing. Now it's time for our regular look at some of the coolest gadget stuff around. This week, music download sites. Here's Tom Dunmore with the critical list. Downloading is now big business. Apple has just sold its billionth song through the iTunes Music Store, which accounts for seven out of every ten songs sold online. But it's worth remembering that iTunes only works with the iPod. If you've got a different player, then it's definitely worth checking out the rivals. Top of the list is Napster. Napster is the world's biggest music subscription service. You pay £10 a month and you can access any of its million plus catalogue. It's got all the major labels there and all the major artists. It's a really great selection and if you pay an extra £5 a month, you can even transfer that music to your portable player. The big problem with Napster is you actually rent your music rather than buying it. So as soon as you stop subscribing, your entire library disappears. Even those tracks that are stored on your player will suddenly not work anymore. If you like the idea of a subscription service, but would rather your songs didn't self-destruct, then it's worth checking out Whippet. Whippet is a British download site that's been around for a few years. It does the standard one pound a track downloads, but what's really amazing is that for 50 pounds, you can subscribe and download up to 60,000 songs. That's over a thousand songs for every pound, music that's quite literally 10 a penny. Now the catalogue isn't as big as Napster's and the front end isn't quite as slick either, but it does offer incredible value and you get to keep those songs even if you stop subscribing. Personally, I like to buy songs in a high resolution MP3 format. That's because although I use an iPod, I don't want to be linked to it for the rest of my life. I want the ability to be able to use any portable device. That's why my favourite download sites are bleep.com and karmadownload.com. Both of them offer a wide range of MP3 music. Bleep specialises in dance music, although increasingly there's lots of other independent labels on it too. It has albums available for $6.99 and tracks for a pound, and you can preview anything before you buy it. Karma Download has a wider range of independent labels, but all at a slightly higher price of £8 an album. Now, on neither Bleep nor Karma will you find any major label content. However, there is loads of independent content out there, and the resurgence of indie music of late means there's plenty on these sites to keep you entertained. 
Of course, once you've got all your MP3s, it's worth backing them up because if your hard drive fails, you will lose everything and you may not be able to download them again. Now, as well as using a CD or a DVD to back them up, you can also upload them to the web, which is where a service like MP3 Tunes comes in so handy. This is a subscription service that costs $40 a year and allows you to upload all your music onto the internet. That's everything you own. It doesn't matter how big your library is. It takes an age to upload it, but it is worthwhile because once it's up there, you can access all your music from any browser on any computer anywhere in the world. The great thing about the world of gadgets and technology is that everything moves so fast. Take, for example, the iPod. It's been around for, what, about five years? But already we've seen eight different versions, only three of which are still in the shops. Chances are that in another five years or so, something completely new will have arrived to make this thing obsolete. The iPod will take its place in gadget history, alongside other greats that have been and gone, like the Walkman, the ZX Spectrum and the Game Boy. In fact, very few classic gadgets ever enjoy a shelf life of more than a few years. And if they do, the tail end is usually a long, slow death, well away from the limelight they once basked in. But of course, there are exceptions, and this is one. This turntable was first launched upon the world in 1972. It underwent an upgrade in 1978, but since then has pretty much remained unchanged. It's played a major part in actually creating a whole musical genre, and for the last 30 years or so, it's been the tool of choice for DJs in almost every club around the world. It's about as classic as a gadget can get. It's the Technics SL1200. But why has this one machine remained so dominant for all that time? Well, we thought the best person to ask would be a superstar DJ. So we looked up DJs in the Oxford English Dictionary. There's only one listed, Pete Tong. When I started out DJing, I was, you, were, you were taking a turntable that you would use, use at home and, and take it into a club. Uh, this thing, is, it grew up in a club. Previously, record decks had been belt-driven and pretty fragile, but the Technics, with its direct-drive motorised turntable and robust design, allowed a completely new style of DJ to emerge. It, it, got, it got in there first, I suppose, is, is, is the best way of putting it, and nobody's been able to dislodge it from number one. Many other companies have come along with a perfectly good turntable that, that looks very, very similar, but it's just not quite right. It's a professional piece of kit. The weight of the turntable, the kind of instant response of the start-stop, it's just 33 or 45. Um, this little thing was always a great gadget, which was the, um, the torch. In a dark DJ booth, you can just about make out what's on the label, and uh, obviously you can also see where to put the needle on the record. The pitch control, the first professional turntable to introduce a pitch control. Um, obviously, you would, you would adjust the pitch, you would increase the speed, um, or you'd decrease the speed. Very, very simple. And then the red one over here on the side of the um, on-off button, the, the strobing effect. When that is still, it, it means that you're definitely at 45 RPM or 33. And obviously, if you start to um, move the pitch control, you'll see the the, the red dots that are moving slowly start to accelerate. And similarly, they'll, or they'll go back the other way. I suppose the only reason they're introduced is if you've got um, some female that's hanging over your turntables, you know, and they're leaning over this bit, then, then obviously you can check whether your, your record's going too fast or too slow, something like that. No. And the last thing, although I'm playing a house record for you here, is it's just you know, back, back cue, you know, very, very true, so, so many turntables. Um, when you put the, uh, the needle on the record and go like that very fast, it will go, it will jump off. It delivers the, the promise. It's, it hardly ever breaks down. In fact, I don't think I've ever had an SL1200 breakdown. It's a pretty good um, advert for it, isn't it? I know, <laughs> and uh, it, just, it just sounds fantastic. I mean, it, it always works. Although the Technics SL1200 is still hugely popular, many DJs have found that digital music has given them a whole new box of tricks to play with. A little later, I'll be showing all you budding DJs just how you could become the next Heat Tong. We'll take a look at some very simple digital solutions that you can use without ever leaving your bedroom.
Welcome back to CBIT. Now, as we said earlier, the biggest story of the show is the launch of this, the Samsung Q1. Together with other similar devices, it's supposed to represent a new breed of ultra-portable touchscreen PC. The launch of the devices here at CBIT is the culmination of months of rather mysterious marketing by Microsoft that's created a buzz around the web about something called the Origami Project. But it hasn't been publicity of a conventional nature. There have been no press releases, no TV commercials. No one from the media has been given one to play with in advance. The reason this product's on everyone's lips is down to so-called viral marketing. That's advertising by word of mouth, or in this case, more precisely, word of web. Viral marketing is where the ad company doesn't pay for any advertising space. No full-page ads in mags, no billboards, no TV. What they create is simply fed out onto the web and us lot distribute it for them. And we do it very, very efficiently. Something posted at the beginning of a working day can be seen by tens of millions of computer users before the evening rush hour has even started. These days, any form of internet communication is exploited as a platform for viral marketing, especially when it comes to gadgetry. Early adopters in the technology market are always keen to know about the latest kit available, and that makes them easy pickings for viral marketers. Start a rumour about something new, and pretty soon it's being discussed on forums and blogs right round the world. And that's precisely what Microsoft did with the launch of the Ultra Mobile PC. They launched this website, projectorigami.com, three weeks before the show. It caused a furore in the blogosphere. The early adopters knew a mysterious product was coming, but what was it? The forums were bubbling. There was also this amateur-looking website, origamiportal.com, which appeared to be the creation of one of those enthusiastic early adopters. You are encouraged to sign up and share the excitement. Lots of people joined in the frenzy, debating in blogs and forums what this mystery product could be, and saying they'd definitely buy one, whatever it was. By the time CBIT opened, everyone was talking about Project Origami, and as a result, the Ultra Mobile PC was the headline of every report sent back from the show. The viral campaign was a resounding success. But all the viral marketing in the world won't help if your product's a duff one. In fact, you could argue that all this enigma-generating, crowd-gathering, expectations-raising activity just makes it a bigger fall if your product's anything less than perfect. Now it's time to return to the subject of digital music mixing. In the past, any budding DJ would need boxes of vinyl, a posse to carry those boxes, decks, and of course, one of these great big glittery balls. These days, with compressed music files, digital music players and fast home computers, you can carry your whole collection around in your pocket. And there's loads of digital hardware and software packages out there designed to turn you into the next Armin van Helden, Milo, or Pete Tong. So, are these digital mixing desks actually any good? Or are they just toys offering a bit of fun? We've lined up three promising models and we're going to ask Pete Tong to try and do his thing. First up is Mixman Studio Pro, which downloads as a free demo version and includes a few music files to get you going. Initial thoughts? Um, not very impressed, really. There's loads of things like this around as kind of freeware. It seems to be very clunky and very slow, but you load um, tracks into your computer, you can then select them on these turntables. I can work out how to put a track on the other turntable here. But when it comes to actually mixing them But actually coming and mixing them, um, it is not intuitive at all, because once you press play here, it plays both of them. The Mixman is definitely not user-friendly, and on this demo version, even the Beats Per Minute control didn't work. And can you imagine using something like this in Manny Mission? If you ever took this into a club, you look like you're checking your emails. Next up is this Hercules DJ Control MP3 deck, which plugs into your PC to access your music files. But also, it has quite a few tricks of its own. This is beginning to look more like the, the kind of professional models on the market. So 
you put it on your cue, and you can actually increase the volume, manipulate the speed as well. You've got um, treble, middle and bottom end. It's got, you know, it's, it's laid out pretty much like a, a, a proper mixer, and the manipulation is pretty good. The longer he used it, the more impressed Pete became with the features on the Hercules, especially with its range of samples and effects. So, did he feel it was a good intro into the world of DJing? The next generation of DJs um, needn't really ever use turntables or CDs. You could quietly, it, literally exist in um, a total kind of digital, um, you know, AIFF MP3 WAV file world. Um, which is, yes, yeah, a shame to, to the traditionalist, I suppose, but it is the future. Our final option is the £229 Newmark IDJ mixing deck, designed to mix two iPods. But these aren't included, so you could be talking about 650 quid if you're setting up from scratch. I think this is massive novelty value. This is definitely um, toys for boys. It's got a wow factor as soon as you see it, but in, in actual fact, all it's doing is enabling you to segue a piece of music from one iPod without a break into, into the other one. Because the new mark can't vary the speeds of the tracks on the iPod, it isn't possible to match beats, which is an essential part of DJing. The minute that they solve that problem, this thing's going to become dangerous, because then it really would have um, a much greater functionality. So, if you're planning to become the next chemical brother or sister, forget the new mark and the freeware and pay £180 for the Hercules. It could be the best investment you ever make.